Freddy Farkas stared at eyes as black and dark as night. The eyes of an outlaw well known throughout the West. Oh, the tough kid's name was Kenny, and he, and he outdrew Freddy Farkas when he shot Freddy's ear off to prove who was the best. Now our hero Freddy Farkas, with wounded pride and earless carcass, bowed to the heavens to give up gunnery. He'd be better off, he reckoned, with a lifelong dream that always beckoned. Pestles, not pistols, and pharmacology. Farkas, Freddy Farkas. Highest score on his SAT. Freddy Farkas, Freddy Farkas. Year college degree. After Fred matriculated, got his PhD and graduated, moved out to Coarse Gold and bought a pharmacy. Now he's a real prescription writer, and they don't know he's an ex gunfighter. Locked up his memories, repressed them totally. But his peaceful new survival soon was shot to hell upon arrival of course school school barn, the sweet Penelope. She has captured Fred's affection, but he's scared he'll get a huge rejection. Can't bear to tell her just what he used to be. Farkas, Freddy Farkas. Frontier pharmacist bourgeoisie Freddy Farkas Freddy Farkas Peerless, earless, and free Freddy Farkas? You was asking about Freddy Farkas? The man what saved Coarse Gold, only nobody knowed it was him? Why, just hop up here on old Whitlin Willie's lap and I'll tell you all about it. Ow, a carn sarnet, a bit more to the right. That's got it, sit right there. Oh no, thank you. Now, if I remembers this right, it's been a quite a few years. My brain's getting a mite rusty. Oh, that's right. 
It all started when Freddie went to open up the pharmacy one day, way back in the spring of 1888, as I recall. The remains of the Sugar Pine and Coarse Gold's engineer's shack lie rotting on the south side of Main Street. Rain barrels are such an important aspect of life in an arid, drought-scourged landscape like this. Water running off the building's roofs is channeled through gutters and downspouts into storage. Oh, wait a minute. This is just no whiskey barrel. Forget it. You've always assumed the Golden Ball Saloon must once have been a pawn shop. Sam Andreas has a tough time keeping these large plate glass windows intact since he's developed a habit of throwing rowdies out through them. The Golden Ball Saloon is presently open. Since it only has swinging doors, it's always open. Mom's Cafe must have good food. It's where all the stagecoaches stop. Peering through Mom's greasy glass, you can see she's open for business. You've always been fond of Mom's cooking. At least the first time it goes down. Once the heart of a thriving business district, there's not much left of beautiful downtown Coarse Gold now. The door to the hotel is locked. The hotel was shut down unexpectedly. This put a total of two desk clerks and five working girls out of jobs. Fortunately, there weren't any maids or they'd have been fired too. You do your peepin' Freddy routine with the hotel window. Furtive shadows steal across the walls inside. What little light seeps into the hotel plays teasingly at vague forms and shapes. How nauseatingly poetic. Chesterfield has been unloading this wagon since last winter. This sign says, Chesterfield's Mercantile Company. It may indicate there's a store inside this building. You just love to window shop through windows so dirty you can't see through them. Maybe you should give Chester some window cleaner for Christmas. An unusual plant grows here. It's a cross between scrub grass and shrubs. It's called scrub. The south side of Main Street holds the remains of the railroad's telegraph office. Taking a serious look at yourself, you decide you like what you see. The sign proclaims this as the post office. Why, he's with the Pony Express. The former post office is staffed by a complete work crew. None of them has yet noticed the place closed down years ago. Looks like the door to the post office has been removed and replaced with a less attractive barrier. Like all proud, red-blooded, Italian-Irish-American barbers, Salvatore O'Hanahan is extremely proud of his pole. Actually, he almost had to give it up when they levied an expensive pole tax. The sign says, O'Hanahan's Barber Shop. Peering through the window, you think you see a barber inside. (music) 
Someone with a higher IQ than most of the folks in town correctly painted Sheriff here. The Sheriff's Window. Not very good at keeping out the rain, but at least nobody's liable to break in. Of course, who'd want to break in? This is the door to Sheriff Checkham P. Shift's office. It contains a small jail cell, just big enough to hold one or two innocent bystanders. The sign says tall and thin shop, and hey, it's right. That's just about the tallest and thinnest shop you've ever seen. It's your ordinary water trough. Favorite hangout of coarse gold horses and town drunks. In brighter days, this trough would be filled with sparkling, clear, pure mountain spring water. The kind they make into lousy domestic beer. These days, though, all you see in the trough is muddy, dirty, old stagnant water with a bunch of dead flies floating on top. The Tall and Thin Shop owner narrowly escaped with his life once when he was discovered short-changing customers. The sign says P.P.'s Playhouse, or it used to anyway. Now it looks more like P.P.'s Playhouse. Can't you read? The sign on the door says closed. This was Coarse Gold's Opera House, P.P.'s Playhouse. It was shut down by unpopular demand several months ago after the owner was found necking with a lamb during a performance of Bet's Feast. These remnants of the coarse gold depot are all tumbled down and shot. You added this hitch a few years ago out of necessity. As they said when you moved in, never get this pharmacy off the ground without a hitch. The sign says Farkas Pharmacy. This must be the place. That's the left pharmacy window. With all the dust out here, it's a pain to keep clean. It's Dominic, one of your part-time Native American employees. He works under the professional name running gag. The union told you that you had to have a cigar store style Indian out in front when you opened your pharmacy. But since there were lots of out of work real Indians in the neighborhood, you decided it would be politically correct to hire them. Morning, Dominic. Morning, Freddy. What's new? Uh, let's see. I finished reading A Century of Dishonor last night. Quite impressive. That Helen Hunt Jackson really knows how to evoke an image of the white man's treachery. Do you know how many treaties your people have signed and then broken in the past 20 years alone? Uh, excuse me, I, I heard someone calling me or something. It's the door to your pharmacy. I knew that. How poetic. The door key and the door key. Score! You unlock the door. Ta-da! 500 points. You're halfway through the game. This sign clearly lets the townsfolk know that the prescription counter is in the back of the store. Someday, maybe there'll be a glass tube there, bent in the shape of the word prescription, filled with a rare gas that will glow in brilliant colors. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Boy, that'd make people actually want to buy drugs. 
This multi-instrument, piano roll-style juke machine is called a symphonium. Trouble is, the company that sold it to you went out of business after producing only one roll. And how many times can a person listen to does your chewing tobacco lose its flavor on the bedpost overnight? This is your pharmacy, where you work, hence the name Farkas's Pharmacy. This bottle is filled with this century's most incredible medical breakthrough. You thought an iced cream stand would attract customers. Mostly it attracts cockroaches, especially now that the iced cream deliveries have stopped. On the upper shelf of the left-hand cabinet you find Pearls of Pauline Anti-Prune Finger Bathing Gel, My Little Cleft Palate Mouth Repair Putty, Dr. Limbaugh's Chuckle-A-Day Cannabis Extract, Cremation Non-Dairy Coffee Ash, Peaches and Cream Brand Cream Peaches, and Chinaman's Choice Real Oriental Curative Straight Pins. This is a deluxe shelving unit featuring polished mahogany inlays, filigreed end caps, extra wide mid-height shelf, and no skid recessed legs. Shelving units for Freddy Farkas provided by Crate and Whiskey Keg. Taking a serious look at yourself, you decide you like what you see. It's a tube of Preparation G, the Wells Fargo wagon driver's friend for over half a decade. Score! You pick up a tube of Preparation G in the handy 25-ounce crabby elephant size. It's St. Joseph, patron saint of chewable aspirin. The top shelf is where you keep all the newest, most scientifically advanced medications safe from shoplifters. Dr. Winterhalter's magnetic effluvium tonic. Professor Munson's deep wound iodine salt bomb. A little goes a long way. And Chaz Burke Squire, PhD's effervescent enema granules. Ah, your diploma from the University of Hicksville School of Apothecary Sciences and other good guesses. The old alma mater. What memories. This is your pharmacy, where you work. Why, Miss Prim, you sure are looking pretty today. Now, Frederick, you may call me Penelope if you please. After all, I think we're to that point in our relationship. She must be talking about the hayride you both went on last month. Or the square dance you both went to last week. Or the cow tipping expedition you both went on last night. Well then, to what do I owe the pleasure of your company this fine morning? Oh, this isn't a social call, I'm afraid. I have this rather important prescription Doc Gillespie gave me. I was hoping you could fill it as soon as possible. My pleasure, Penelope. This door leads to your back office, laboratory, and the stairs to the second floor. This chair was left here by the previous owner of the pharmacy, Franklin Farquat. Why, it's your old roll-top desk. What happened to that roll you recently left on top of it? You must have eaten it. It's a lamp, and a bodaciously ugly one at that. Some buxom lady's portrait. Notice how the painting seems to follow you around the room. And I don't mean her eyes. 
your reference bookshelf, complete with such top 10 medical reading as Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Pustules But Were Too Revolted to Ask, Tie Flying Book of Blackhead Removal, Boil Lancing, and Facial Renovation, The Dermatologist Who Came In from the Cold Sore, The 1882 Edition of What Color Is Your Parasite, The One Minute Mandibula, A Globe, and Some Souvenirs of Your First Customers. It's your hand-hooked rug. One of Madam's hookers handed it to you. You keep your anatomical models in here. But don't worry, you're not the only one in town with a few skeletons in your closet. It's a picture of some nearby big rock. You keep a pitcher of water in a basin so you can occasionally wash your face. This old table is left over from your college days. Your authentic moose skin rug looks very attractive with those eyeglasses on it. It would have been a mite less lumpy if somebody had remembered to skin the moose first. You stumbled onto this big old dresser at a moving sale and broke your toe. Though so rather than pay to have your toe fixed, the owner lets you keep the dresser. In fact, you get all your furniture by accident. Your grooming aids. Swedish leather lysbianoid scalpicide. Santa Fe ear hair revitalizer. And old Mr. Smathers preferred gum pinkener. You ran across this desk chair outside the general store. In so doing, you tripped and knocked out two teeth. You threatened to sue the owner, but he placated you by giving you this fine chair to keep. Lovely old glass-fronted bookcase containing some of your favorite leisure time reading material. Thoracic Park by Michael Crowton. A Brief History of Slime by Lugie J. Hawking. Diabetics by O. Mom Hubbard. Nasal Passages by Gail Shewiz, and How to Satisfy a Sheep Every Time and Make It b -b 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 for More, which you keep out of sight behind the other volumes. You picked up this old armoire at the farmer's market. It gave you a hernia. So instead of paying the doctor's bills, the owner let you keep it. A small picture of your mother, rest her soul. If only she could have lived to see you now. An ex-gun-slinging pharmacist in coarse gold, California. She'd have had a heart attack and died. It's your seamy, pasturepedic, 100% rawhide-filled mattress. You bumped into it at a sidewalk sale and fractured your shin. They let you take it home, which was cheaper than paying to have your leg fixed. This is your cozy little bedroom. I wonder how this would look if I added a little paneling. While browsing at a second-hand store, you were struck by this particularly sturdy reading lamp. The result was a mild concussion. The guy who'd accidentally dropped it out of the second-story window was very apologetic and, rather than pay for the skull surgery, offered to let you take the lamp home with you. That just doesn't work like that. Score! You take the key. Hot dog! Now we're getting somewhere! Unlock the desktop. You unlock the desk drawer. Score! 
you take the letter out of the drawer. You lock the drawer. You lock the desktop. You never know who's going to sneak in here and try to get their hands in your drawers. You received this letter a few years back from your recently dearly departed friend, Phil Graves. Dear Freddy, Thank you so very kindly for your gracious hospitality during my recent convalescence. The floor of your workroom proved a comfortable bed, and the stale pharmacy goods you fed me staved off starvation quite adequately. I must admit to being a little curious of your request that I retain your safety deposit key for you. I cannot imagine what you have secured in that bank vault that could create such strong feelings of both revulsion and endearment. However, I have done as you asked and taken your key with me. I vow to you I will never return this key to you, nor even allow it within your sight. I further swear to keep it with me wherever I go. On this you have my word of honor, for I am ever your friend, Philip D. Graves. You turn the paper over looking for a return address or something, but there isn't one. Why the poor dear! You turn the prescription over looking for a locker combination or something, but there's nothing written on the other side. Why the poor dear, she must be suffering from the vapors, those injurious exhalations produced within the body creating feelings of hypochondria and depression. Her prescription is in Doc's usual scrawl and smells of whiskey, so you know it's authentic. That's your laboratory, where you concoct and bottle your formulas. You study Penelope's prescription and prepare to carefully fill it. You wouldn't want to make a mistake with her medicine. Click the measuring device on the container, not vice versa. You carefully label the container Miss Penelope Prim, for internal use only. And what internals they are, you dream about them day and night. Thank you, Frederick. This looks perfect. You are a scholar and a gentleman. Aw, oh, shucks. I'm just a poor pharmacist trying to please my favorite customer. Will I see you again soon? I think that can be arranged, Frederick. See you soon. I'll be waiting. So long now, Penelope. Unfortunately, you were so taken with Penelope's angelic presence that you forgot to charge her the 19 cents she owed you. Good day, friend.
pretty, pretty parkas! Well, good day to you, Ms. Back. What can I do for you today? Well, Freddy Farkas, Dr. Gillespie, that no good gin soap saw no lush, wrote me this damn prescription that'll probably cost me an arm and a leg. Here, take it. The rock gut from that old wino doctor is making my new ensemble stink to high heaven, I want to tell you. Helen Back's prescription is barely legible due to all the whiskey spots, but you eventually decipher it. You hold the prescription up to the light to see if you can see any secret messages, but nothing is visible. You study Helen Back's prescription and prepare to carefully fill it. This is where you concoct all your potions, pills, and powders. It's here that you truly earn the right to call yourself Freddy Farkas, Frontier Pharmacist. Carefully label the container, Mrs. Helen Back. Take three times daily just before meals. That'll be 22 cents, Miss Back. Y'all just uh, put it on my tab. I don't have it with me right now. Pretty Cherie. Just slide that handsome pharmacist's butt on over here. I got something I need from you. Morning, Sadie. What have you got? Well, I got a prescription here I need filled. Something that'll increase my womanly powers, if you know what I mean. Be a dear and fill it for me right away, won't you? I simply can't wait to try it out. Your wish is my command, madam. You take the prescription from the madam. What a busy morning. You haven't had to fill this many prescriptions since Custer's troops stayed at the Dirty Sheet Hotel. This prescription is impossible to read. That's what happens when Doc writes a prescription through bleary, whiskey-soaked eyeballs. You try reading it backwards, but it's still a whiskey-sodden, poorly written prescription. Dang that Doc Gillespie anyway.
Excuse me, Sadie. I've got to run out for a bit. Hang on, I'll be right back. Okay, Freddy, but hurry back. Welcome to Sam Andreas' Golden Balls Saloon. He was going to call it Sam Andreas' Nugget, but decided that that had disgusting sexual overtones. Sam Andreas owns and runs the Golden Balls Saloon. He's smart, savvy, and generous to a fault. Sam Andreas' Burnished Maplewood Bar is the one bar to belly up to when you're bellying up to more than one. Sam has stocked the bar with every brand of cheap rot gut listed in the Mr. Fresno's Saloon Keeper Guide. DeViper Venom Flavored Schnapps, Granny's Walker Black, MD 20W40, Cuddly Shark Blended Botched Whiskey, Wild Smoked Turkey, Harold's Bristle Cream Slurry, oh, and a bottle of David Bowie, a sweetened liqueur. A beautiful mural from the starving artists of Oxnard. They used to hold sales a couple of times a year over in the lobby of the Dirty Sheet Hotel. Well, if it ain't Sam Andreas, the bartender's bartender. If it's not, I'm having a severe identity crisis. How the heck are you? Tolerably well. Yourself? Can't complain. Pharmacy business seems to be pretty good lately. Ah, well the pharmacy business has always been a little too interesting for me to hear about, so, eh, don't be a stranger. It appears to be a tiny picture of some field mice playing poker. It's Neville Shute, the piano player. He's doing the best he can. This honky-tonk piano is 82 and a half keys of pure musical entertainment. The saloon is filled with rugged, rough-hewn tables. This particular one is reserved for rowdy, ugly, nasty, and mean drunks. In other words, it's open seating. This is a chandelier. Most nights you can find at least one or two drunken, rowdy cowhands swinging from this thing. The business must be a mite slow today. This is the world famous Golden Ball stage. Most days you can find major vaudeville acts here bringing their own unique brands of music, comedy, dance and magic to the deserving folks of course gold. Some of the more popular acts include The Amazing Baloney, Bruce the Singing Sashay and Cowboy, Mimi Dottie and Franny the Singing Siamese Triplets with a little back trouble, and Young Dogies in Love. Play it, Neville! Neville, in order not to lose track of the piece he's playing, says nothing. However, he raises his eyebrows as if to say, Certainly, sir, I'll be happy to play whatever selection you'd care to hear. And what's more, I'll make this old piano sound like a whole orchestra. looks suspiciously like a door. It's a likeness of chastity. One of the girls over at Madame Overy's. 
She's so lifelike, you feel as if you could just reach out and touch her. And you'd save two dollars that way, too. It's a hat rack where the patrons hang their hats, coats, gun belts, and the occasional short stranger. This is the Wheel of Fortune table. Guess the right number and Sam will tell you your fortune. Welcome to Course Gold, strangers. I haven't seen you around these parts before. You new in town? You hear the unmistakable sound of grinding and cracking teeth. You hear the splitting, tearing sound of six severely chapped lips curling up in ugly sneers. You hear the pop of knuckles as three trigger fingers flex in readiness. You decide your friendly offhand comments have been misinterpreted. This dice game is known as chuck -a luck Since you're living in coarse gold, you've apparently chucked your luck already. This roulette table is for casino night. It's a moose head, the only domestic brand Sam serves. That's old Doc Dizzy Gillespie. He's been drinking again. Must be office hours. It's Doc's whiskey glass, mostly empty right now. Doc! Hey, Doc! Huh? What's that? Are you drunk again? Me? Drunk? Never. I'm as sober as the day I was pot off my ass. <laughs> I mean, the day I was born. You pick up the whiskey glass. Now you can see this prescription the way Doc wrote it. You thrust the prescription and the whiskey glass under Doc's nose. Hey, Doc! This says testosterone. You really want to prescribe this to a woman? Testosterone? Hmm. No, I suppose that would be on if. Uh, yeah. Uh, and if. Yeah. Uh, a poor choice. Let's see. This was for Sadie Overy, right? Hmm. I must have. Uh, I must have meant something else. L let me fix it. Ooh. There you go. Take this back to your pharmacy and have fun. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. Don't come crying to me, George Bailey. I'm going to swear out a warrant for your arrest. Hmm? Score! Looks like somebody scratched, and badly, too. How? Yeah, yeah. Time for you shift over. Oh, police. You've been reading too many dime novels. Stop talking like that. Just trying to please the tourist, Herb. Sure, sure, tourist. Whatever. See you later. I'm going to go soak my corns. My people call it maize. Peace.
How goes it, Pete? Just fine, Mr. Farkas. Just fine. Sure is a nice day today. Yes, Pete. It's beautiful out. I was wondering if it might be possible for me to knock off a little early today. Something in particular going on? Well, it's just such a nice day. I thought I'd spend a little quality time with the buffalo. Maybe take them to Yosemite, let them run around and do some grazing. You know, the usual. I suppose that'd be okay. Sure, you can leave early. Just watch out for poachers now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny one, Mr. Farkas. I'll be sure to do that. Poachers. <laughs> like anyone would want to do that to Buffalo. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> I'm back, Sadie. Sorry for the delay. I just had to check out a few things. Perfectly okay, Freddy Hahn. <laughs> I was just admiring the way you display your goods. <laughs> Look who's talking. You study Doc's corrections to Madame Overy's prescription and prepare to carefully fill it. This is where you can This is where This is This is where You carefully label the container, Madam Overy. Freddy dear. That's gonna be 22 cents, Sadie, but for you, I'll make it 19. What do you say we just sorta take it out in trade? 
<laughs> I'm a mite short this week. Well... Why, thank you, Freddy. Ooh, you sweet potato pie. I'll catch you tonight, maybe, huh? Or if or. Hey, Farkas! My butt's killing me! He does know how to make an entrance, doesn't he? Sorry to hear that, Smithy. Yeah, so give me some of that preparation, Jake. Score! That'll be 15 cents, Smithy. But I don't suppose you can pay me. Are you saying I can't pay my bills fair and square, Farkas? Well, yeah, I'm gonna settle up tabs with you anyway, since I'm gonna leave in town. Here's what I owe you. Smithy pays you his tab. A whole four dollars eighty-seven cents. Holy moly, a windfall! You're rich! Well, kinda sorta. And if you take my advice, you get out of this town, Farkas. Sheriff's closing people up right and left. Something stinks. I mean them horses because they're farting up a storm, I'm telling you. It was like to pass out. Somebody must have put something in their feet. I don't know what, but I'll tell you, don't go striking no matches out there. Good luck to you, Farkas. You was always one of the good ones. Good luck to you, Smithy. Your strong back and gruff but good-hearted demeanor will be sorely missed. But you was a stranger. I'm here to check out your fire safety per the new town regulations. Oh, look here. It's a good thing I came, Farkas. I'm gonna have to shut this place up tighter than a piss ant scrotum. But, Sheriff, how could you? What's the charge? I haven't done anything wrong. Fire hazard, my boy. Fire hazard. Why, this building's a terrible fire hazard. Looks to me like this whole damn building's made out of wood. But, Sheriff, every building in this town is constructed of wood. I don't know nothing about that, son. Tough luck, Farkas. From now on, just keep the front door locked. But what am I supposed to do, Sheriff? This is my livelihood. If an eyes you, I'd talk to the bank. Good day. So Freddy was forced to shut down the old pharmacy again his will. But he vowed to keep the place up, knowing that someday he'd be opening it up again. Problem being, the sheriff, an ornery cuss if there ever was one, was doing this all over town. The hotel, the playhouse, the smithy, the tall and thin shop, closing them all down on some flimsy pretext. There was no telling who was going to be next. Who'd put the sheriff up to it? And what was happening with the horses, for crying out loud? It were a mystery, says I. Somebody's poor horse seems to be dispelling huge quantities of a noxious methane compound. You cleverly lock the door.
the door swings open. From the back, you hear Chester's voice. Help yourself. I'll be right out. This is a brand that used to be popular. Assorted size buckets, chicken, grease, slaw, taters, and brown gravy-like paste not included. Barrels of Chester Fields' most famous smoked delicacies. This is the interior of Chester Fields Mercantile Company. He used to call it a general store until he ran out of generals. These are big old crates of the newest taste sensation sweeping the east. Too bad it hasn't reached the west coast yet, hence all these full boxes. Sacks of bachelor's favorite flour. It's a nice picture of a pussycat laying on its back. This is an old kerosene lantern. Severe wear non-clad kettles. A hank of rope. These industrial strength heavy duty cast lead pans are coated with mercury chlorine compound in order to make them stick resistant. It's an early American bug zapper. It's a scented candle with bits of gunpowder melted into it. Then is the day you'd find Willie, Chester, Smithy, and a few others in here, all with their feet up on this old pot-bellied stove, playing checkers, whittling, and expectoratin'. They stopped doing that after the backs of their ankles got too crispy. It's Whitlin' Willie. He's been here ever since you got to Coarse Gold, and he hasn't aged a day. He's always been about 140 years old. He spins a mean yarn, and somehow he always seems to know what people did, even when he wasn't in the room. Hey there, Willie. That's Whitlin' Willie to you, son. Respect your elders. Sorry. Forget about it. Just get out of here. I'm Whitlin. The heavily stocked back counter runs along the eastern wall of the general store. A paper bag lies there. A small metal mirror. It's a horseshoe from Chester's old swayback horse that got spooked by a wagon, ran into the street and broke its leg under the wagon wheel. Chester sent it to a veterinarian in San Francisco at outrageous cost, but in the end the horse died anyway, took every penny Chester had since the horse meat guy wouldn't buy the carcass. Guess he keeps the horseshoe up there for good luck. This coffee grinder from the 1883 Shears catalog makes two big cranks they've got in this store. Considering that there's nothing for sale here, you wonder why Chester even bothers keeping these brown paper sacks around. Score! You take a complimentary paper bag. That just doesn't work like that.
Sam, Sam, don't let anyone go out on the street till I give you the say-so. The town's being smothered in horse gas. I don't know how it's happened, but I'm gonna do something before we all choke to death. Yes, I thought somebody burnt some popcorn or something. Silent but deadly for sure. But don't worry about my customers, Fred. They're not going anywhere. It's Barbara Mandrill and the Bobettes, stars of stage, screen, and barnyard. Score! Hey, Sam. Give me a case of the beer you just got in from St. Louis. One case of lowbrow for the pharmacist. Coming right up. Sam hands you a case of lowbrow. The beer that gave St. Louis blues. Now, you know that this beer doesn't come corked, right? They're using some newfangled pinched metal tops. No problem, Sam. I'll take care of it. All right. Fine. That'll be $4.87. Here you go. Nice bankroll. Come back anytime. Doc, what do you recommend for extreme flatulence? Vespus, beans and pizza usually do the trick for me. Blah. Dad Gum's traveling medicine show wagon sits nearby, awaiting the return of Dad Gum and the start of the traveling medicine show season. A gnarled old tree grows next to the synagogue and stretches up, forming a canopy over the yard. There are a few assorted old trunks sitting on top of Dad Gum's wagon. Wow, some of Dad Gum's magic elixir. This stuff can be used to cure a wide variety of conditions. The foremost being sobriety. Score! You surreptitiously swipe the elixir, looking around to see if anybody's watching. Fortunately, nobody is. It's the roof of Reverend Cy Hallelujah's house. These stairs lead up to the balcony of the closed hotel. A colorful poster for Nun Style Beer hangs on the back of Mom's Cafe. Nun Style Beer, pure brewed in God's country, now in redeemable bottles. Somebody posted a flyer here trying to convince the town council to bring co-ed rodeo to the San Jokin Valley. Some old empty half kegs are sitting outside the saloon. There's an ice pick stuck into a barrel here. Score! You pull the ice pick out of the barrel and gingerly place it in your pocket. Just don't bend over suddenly or you'll circumcise yourself. Of course, that won't be any skin off your nose.
This small yard opens up to Bluff Street on the north side. The south side faces the back end of the saloon and Mom's Cafe. The hotel flanks the east side and the old abandoned synagogue lies to the west. This window looks in on the kitchen of Mom's Cafe. It's Mom's Cafe, owned by Helen Back, the surliest mom in the West. Helen Back, proprietor of Mom's Cafe, is better known as Mom. If she was my mom, I'd run away from home. Mom's counter is clean and spanking white. Helen Back is anal retentive about cleanliness. The kitchen counter. Let's see, you count one kitchen. There's nothing on the counter you need. These swinging doors lead to the kitchen. It's Hopalong Singh, Helen's faithful cook from the Far East. He used to work as a professional chef for a chain of Ponderola restaurants. Rumor has it that Helen Back keeps the heads of her three dead husbands somewhere behind the Melmac plates and dishes in that china cabinet. Mom has stored some decorative empty bottles, plates, and those unique and wonderful air ferns she bought out of Pureed magazine on this high shelf. Homey red and white striped spotless tablecloths cover Mom's tables. A decorative oil lamp is attached to the wooden support beam. Charlotte Roos, one of the local gossips, is stuffing her face with dessert, a sponge cake and whipped cream monstrosity. It makes your arteries seize up just looking at her. It's Penelope. Just look at the way she sits at that table and eats and talks. Isn't she simply dreamy? My sweetheart! It's Sarah Hartburn, the director of the local community theater. She's doing some power clatching, massacring several cheese Danish, numerous cups of cappuccino, and three or four reputations. This is a bottle of Mom's home-pressed apple cider. Mom is merciless to those poor apples. As she turns the press, she screams, Die, you suckers, die! <laughs> P&W corn. Firm, crisp kernels that look as good coming out as they do going in. It's an old empty can of P&W beans. The firm, crisp beans that smell as savory on the way out as they do on the way in. Hey, Mom, would you mind if I took this empty can? If you must, I suppose there's more where that came from. In fact, I insist you take it. Get it out of here. I'm sick of the sight of it. Penelope, be careful. For some reason, the horses in town are expelling huge quantities of gas. It's not safe outside. My, 
hero. I'll just stay inside until it's safe. Thank you, Freddy. You may have just saved my life. I suppose I'll have to find a way to repay your kindness, if that's all right with you. Why, sure. I mean, wow, hot dog, Penelope. I mean, uh, sounds good. Howdy, Sarah. Any big productions planned this season? She ignores you. Apparently she doesn't like to be interrupted in mid-slander. Mom, you'd better keep everyone inside till I can get this horse flatulence thing straightened out. Not that it's any of your business, but I'll be keeping my customers in here as long as I can. Of course, if they just keep ordering wheat tea and you want a biscuits, I'll toss their butts into the street. Can't make any money selling tea and frickin' biscuits. Pop Singh, I just want to warn you not to go outside and not to let your customers go outside till we've cleared the air. We having big argument or something? No, not that I know of. Then why need to clear the air? Oh, never mind. Go outside all you like. Thank you for kind permission. Freddy Farkas, look what you all brought in with you. What's next? Honestly, I swan. Hello, Mrs. Roos. That sure is a lovely dessert you're wearing today. Here stands the only bank in town, the first bank of Bob. The founder must have had a hard time coming up with an original name for his establishment. You recall with fondness that wonderful old blacksmith who used to operate this shop. What the hell was his name anyway? Smithy has truly left town for good. A length of leather bridle hangs on the smithy's door. Smithy left behind a coil of rope. Score! You take the leather strap. Smithy won't be needing it now, wherever he is. That just doesn't work like that. You take the rope. Now that Smith is closed up shop, he won't be missing it. Smithy's once proud forge is cold and dark. Score! Digging through Smithy's formerly white hot forge, you find an unused hunk of charcoal which you decide may well be of use to you. So you keep it. With all the precision of a serial killer, you deftly poke some holes in the tin can with the ice pick. Ha! Having accomplished your immediate desire, and in the process hopelessly dulling the ice pick, you exhibit absolutely no regard for this barren piece of locality laughingly called the environment by brazenly tossing the ice pick away. You're such a consumer. You slip the leather strap through the holes in the tin can. They fit perfectly. Congrats! You always wanted a tin feed bag. Score!
you drop the charcoal into the tin can. Now we're getting somewhere. Score! Score! <laughs> you take a few deep breaths from the gas mask, clearing your head and enabling you to go on a while longer. It's an anvil, cast of iron, and really very heavy. If this old worn-out saddle could only talk, he'd probably complain about the prevalence of beans in the standard Kahan diet. For one brief, shining moment, there truly was a place called Cattle Lot. You take a few deep breaths from the gas mask, clearing your head and enabling you to go on a while longer. A really terrifically disgusting idea. Unfortunately, the horse's tail momentarily blocks your access. Score! In what may well be the most revolting idea you've ever had, you hold the brown paper sack up to the horse's anal sphincter and wait. With a reverberating, the horse responds, inflating your bag with a foul sample of gas. You quickly twist the bag shut to lock in freshness. You take a few deep breaths from the gas mask, clearing your head and enabling you to go on a while longer. You're beginning to feel a little lightheaded. Better use your gas mask. You unlock the door. Dang it! No points this time. <laughs> you take a few deep breaths from the gas mask, clearing your head and enabling you to go on a while longer. Fill the alcohol lamp with Dad Gum's alcoholic elixir. Good idea, Freddy. The spectrum lines on that etched glass viewer reveal volumes to those who know how to read.
This is where you can come. This is where. You carefully label the jar aminophilic citrate. Congratulations, you've just created your first batch of Farkas's deflatulizer. You carefully pour the deflatulizer into the horse's water trough. The horses greedily lap up the delish and nutrish medicated trough water. Seeing as how his home brewed patootie sealant done the trick on these horses, Freddy ran round and dumped the stuff into all the horse troughs in town. It weren't long before the folks of Coarse Gold was all breathing a sigh of relief. Freddy tossed away his homemade gas mask. Kind of a shame, too, since he could have made a purdy penny off the patent rights. Life returned to normal for a short spell, any hooch, until one lazy day when one of the local inbreds came a running up with the latest calamity. Board up your windows and doors. Lock up the women and children. Run for the border, Louise. There's a stampede a-coming. A stampede! Hurry up, Freddy. You only got a week and a half before they get here. A week and a half? They snails! Snails? Snails? Good heavens! This is the worst thing to happen to coarse gold since the great hail of clams back in 83. Shrubs and weeds grow amongst the wreck of the old train depot. It's the old abandoned assay office, once owned by a subsidiary of the old abandoned mine company. Before the mine shut down, this is where you got your nuggets appraised. Now you have to go to Madam's for that. This is the old red schoolhouse, one of the few buildings that still seems solid and safe. It's Sissy playing on the slide. The boys call him that because his mother dresses him so effeminately. It's a ladder propped up against the slide so the kids can play. It's a sea shanty. See? 
Shandy. It's a long plank firmly attached to some sort of axle, allowing one side to pivot upwards while the other side descends. When the kids play on it, one of them teeters at the top and the other totters at the bottom. Say, you've got an idea for what you could call this thing. A kitty pult. Penelope, quick, you're in danger. Why, Frederick, you're all flushed and blotchy. What's wrong? There's a stampede headed this way. Well, slowly, but still. If I don't act quickly, the whole town's gonna get slimed. I simply don't understand. Slimed? That sounds distasteful. It's snails, Penelope. You've got to get the children inside. Well, if it's only snails, Frederick, I'm sure we have enough time for recess, don't we? Well, yeah. Frederick, why don't you run and be a man and divert the stampede or do whatever a real hero would do? I'll keep my eye on the children for the time being. I'll make you proud, Penelope. You'll see. This used to be the bakery, where Letta Rise a while sold all sorts of delicious breads, pies, and cakes. There was a sudden surge in muffin popularity on the East Coast, so Letta closed up shop and moved out East to take advantage of it. Now that she's out East, she misses the fields of the San Joaquin Valley. So she named her new chain of bakeries, Mrs. Fields. Taking a serious look at yourself, you decide a block and tackle was erected here for unloading wagons. Unfortunately, it couldn't block and tackle at the same time. It's the old grist mill. Since Mr. Grist left town, not much happens here. The windmill turns steadily in the arid, coarse gold trade winds. Once this was the mayor's mansion, before he turned old and gray. Yep, the old gray mare ain't what it used to be. This tank stores the whole town's drinking water supply. There's a spigot at the base of the water tower. The outhouse has a signature half-moon cutout. That house used to belong to the mine foreman, back when the mine was still operating. Some old farming and milling equipment sits in disrepair further back on Collier Bluff. It's one of the entrances to the old abandoned mine, now boarded up for safety's sake. This is the eastern portion of Bluff Street, so named for scenic Collier Bluff. By the side of the road sits an old covered wagon. It's covered for theft and fire. Those darned kids! Don't they have anything better to do than hide joy buzzers under the outhouse seat? A variety of polypetalous green, fleshy, spiny members of the family Cactaceae grow in spurts around the foundation of the church. Aren't you sorry you asked? This is the Reverend Sai Hallelujah's church. Nobody's going in or out. What with everyone leaving town, the Reverend seems to have lost his following. Yep, he's been de-flocked. 
the stained glass windows are miraculously intact. A variety of polypetalous green, fleshy, spiny members of the family Cactaceae grow in spurts around the foundation of the church. Aren't you sorry you asked? You can't look through the keyhole. It's blocked. Candles in the church foyer are glowing with a holy light. There seems to be something in the lock. You wisely reconsider your idea of pushing on the stained glass to see if it's still in good shape. Score! You take the key to the church. A squeaky old sheep weather vane turns gently on top of Reverend Hallelujah's house. Perhaps he's trying to get people to join his flock. Reverend Cy Hallelujah lives here. A stagecoach converted to a hearse is mired in the mud here minus one wheel. Once this was a one hearse town. Now it's a no hearse town. One of Hyman Untertaker's coffins is lying in disrepair off near Reboot Hill. It looks like a cedar model number seven. Eternal slumber and no moths. A wrought iron and stone archway beckons all to Reboot Hill. Perhaps you'll be the next occupant. <laughs> Are you scared yet? Huh? It's the old abandoned synagogue. A gnarled old tree stretches above the old abandoned synagogue. That's Hyman Undertaker's shop. He's the town undertaker. Perched on the top of the post is an angel, her arms outstretched. At the base of the statue is a small plaque which reads, I love you this much. Couldn't you just surrender your lunch? The tall stone fence posts are pebbled and worn from years of rain, wind, and tourists. A robust, healthy, prickly pear cactus grows near the edge of Reboot Hill. Must be all the nitrogen-rich fertilizer in the local soil. This is world-famous Bad Rock, so-called because of the day many years ago that part of it dislodged and just missed a carriage full of students on their way to Chowchilla. It was a black, black day, which is why they eventually turned it into a movie, Black Day at Bad Rock. Someone made a mesa the desert. A rickety old fence stands by Collier Bluff, ready to fall down at any second. They started to build an outhouse here, but municipal funds ran out during construction, so the builder did a half-assed job. Hmm, not much privacy, but the ventilation is excellent. The sign says, I'm an Untertaker, and you're not. A noose swings lazily in the breeze, always a gloomy sign. Well, you know what I always say, no noose is good noose. It's Temple Beth Gesundheit.
Oh, a child is playing by the side of the bridge. How delightful. Morning, son. Why, I can remember playing right by this very bridge when I was your age. What a liar you are. You were born in old St. Louis. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I listen to the prologue like everybody else. In fact, I can't get the darn thing out of my head. I've been hearing it in my sleep. Thanks loads. Whew. That was a close one. Considering the condition of this old bridge, you may only have about three crossings left. Reverend Hallelujah's horses mosey around in his corral. One of Reverend Sy's horses is out frolicking in the spring sun. Well, maybe it's not frolicking exactly. Here, horsey! Here, horsey! The horse seems to be saying, Here meaning what? Here meaning if I come over there, I'll get a patronizing pat on the nose for my trouble. I smell no carrots on you. I smell no lumps of sugar. Forget you. The Robertson Cliffs overlook the thick, beautiful, shimmering waters of Blackwater Creek. The old bridge still offers shaky access to the desert to the west. You wonder why the waters of Blackwater Creek are so black and gooey. And disgusting. The rusty tracks of the fish camp and Pacific Railroad used to continue across the trestle here and wend their way to exciting far-off places like Fresno. The train doesn't come here anymore ever since the trestle collapsed and the train sunk into the swamp. No more lumber shipments, no more ice deliveries, no more personal hygiene products. The Robertson Cliffs overlook the thick, beautiful, shimmering waters of Blackwater Creek. The old bridge still offers shaky access to the desert to the west. Snails are the leading edge of a stampede of imported French escargot recently escaped from a haughty San Francisco restaurant being chased by a posse of snooty San Francisco chefs. They appear to stretch to the horizon and they're heading straight for town. If you don't do something soon to prevent them, they'll slime the entire city. The local insect population has been thriving, what with all the dry weather course goals been having lately. This is one of the smaller ant hills around the town. Once, the Fish Camp and Pacific Railroad ran through here. But when their trestle washed out back in 73, they never got around to rebuilding it. It remains there today, a blatant assault on liability standards everywhere. Prickly pear cactus is one of your favorite examples of the species. Some splendid saguaro cacti dot countryside. With muscles bulging from years of grappling with childproof caps, you deftly wield the church key and wrench the tops from all the beer bottles. Score! Score! You grab a couple of snails from the front of the pack while imagining the aroma of warm, drawn butter.
Hey, boys, it's Miller time! And with that, you cleverly pour bottle after bottle of Sam Andreas' St. Louis brew into the dusty road in an attempt to divert the stampede. Will it work? Will the snails fall for your ruse? Will they accept a domestic? Slurping their little hearts out, if snails may be said to slurp or to have hearts for that matter, the little guys follow your lead straight over to the cliff beside Blackwater Creek. Isn't that cute? They're so gullible. Don't they look just like little lemmings marching over that cliff? Look out, Freddy. Engines? No, wait. This one's an Indian. A real Indian. From India. He sits atop an ant hill surrounded by swarms of ants looking trapped. You feel sorry for him. If there were only some way you could help him. Hello, stranger. I haven't seen you around these parts before. I know it's none of my business. But why are you sitting on top of an active anthill in the heat of this semi-desert sun? Oh, my former fellow! I am but a weary traveler from a land far, far away, journeying here peacefully merely to experience the curative powers of your local mineral waters. The other members of my stagecoach party claiming a frustration with my excessive verbosity and sesquipedalian inclinations forcefully placed me in my current sitting position on this lovely feature of your landscape, knowing full well that because of religious reasons I would be unable to climb down by myself. How cruel those Yosemite-bound tourists are! My name is Frederick Farkas. I own the local pharmacy here in Coarse Gold. How do you do, Mr. Farkas? My name is Srini Lalkaka Paginish. Pardon me if I don't get up. Hmm, I've been considering taking on a loyal Indian sidekick. I'm seeking a new assistant down at the pharmacy. Would you be considering a relocation to this area? You know, Coarse Gold offers extremely reasonable housing costs and an abundance of sunny weather, and is close to schools and churches. Well, no. Not really, but yes, perhaps I would be willing, but as you can readily see, I'm quite busy at this current moment. Have you considered climbing down and walking away? I cannot possibly do that. Life is sacred. If I were to move, I should indubitably injure some of these small six-legged life forms. I'm sure someone will come along soon to the aid of me. I'll see what I can do, Srini. Rover earned his name the hard way. He lives from paw to mouth all around town. Rover earned his name the hard way. It feels like part of the ambience that makes coarse gold so priceless. Or should that be worthless? Rover earned his name the hard way. He lived.
The ladder, held in place by a couple of old loose screws, easily comes away from the slide. You somehow cram it into your pocket along with the rest of the junk you're carrying. Way to go, Freddy. Wreck the little kid's playground equipment. If only they knew how good and true your heart is. Score! <laughs> Hello, sissy. My, your golden locks are looking pretty today. Sissy glares at you with a look that says, I know a thousand ways to cause pain to a human body. You want to start counting? You can't think of anything to say to that. Hello, Weebix. How are you this morning? She pointedly stares away from you, counting to herself and looking just a bit peeved. One, five, nine, thirty-three, four, seven and a half, two, six. <laughs> I've confused you now, haven't I? Weebix's eyes get very large and well up with tears. She sets her jaw firmly and keeps jumping. Starting with one. You are not proud of yourself. Penelope! You were magnificent, the way you stopped that stampede and cured those flatulent horses. Gosh, Penelope, you know I'd move a mountain for you if I could. I think perhaps I've misjudged you, Frederick. Misjudged me? Indeed. I used to think you were a little, you know, mild-mannered. But I like a man who knows how to use his wits and his muscles. I do believe we may be ready to take this relationship to its next step. Yee-haw! Yeah, I mean, oh, that would be something I, I think is feasible. The child appears perfectly happy with her lot in life. Of course, what child wouldn't be happy to be dirty? The ladder might assist my situation. However, I am not in positioning to maneuver it thusly to facilitate escapage. I've got it, Srini. I know how I can help you. Here you go, partner. Hook your way across this. Score! Oh! My balance sense is stretching now! You made it! Oh, thank you, Mr. P. You saved me! Please don't call me that. 
Thank you again, Mr. Ref. I am so much grateful. Oh? Grateful enough to accept the assistance position I mentioned earlier? I could really use some help around the shop. I would be honored. Where do I begin? So Freddy headed on back to the pharmacy, followed by the eternally grateful Srini Lakaka Bagnish. Seems like Freddy not only found himself a new assistant at the pharmacy, but also a good friend as well. So as my assistant, I want you to help me around the store, clean up, you know, the usual chores. Oh, I would be highly gratuitous of your bending over to display me such a position. Would you be offering as well a form of payment? I'll pay you ten cents a day and all the rustler's stove chocolates you can eat. That is an agreement. Excellent. Uh, um, what was your name again? Srini Lakaka Bagnish. But you may call me Srini, and I will be calling you Freddy. Okay? Okay, now let's get cracking, Srini. I'd like you to go out there and create some nice displays for the skin lotions. We may be closed temporarily, but we'll be opening sooner or later, and we've got to be ready. What it is, Freddy? I will be getting on that now. Mind the store, won't you, Srini? I'm off to uphold justice and stuff. Okie the dokey! fella and doesn't pay to pick a fight with Sam Andreas. Damn flies! This place is like a stable! Helen, have you ever thought of putting escargot on the menu? Huh! Don't know who around here will eat these since they don't give you gas, but I'll put them in a bag of cornstarch and think about it. And I suppose thank you is in order, so thank you. Score! Flies in the summer, snow fleas in the winter. God, but I miss Missouri. Mom, where are all your customers? Dang if I know. They all jumped up at more or less the same time and ran to the outhouse. It's not my fault, though. They hadn't even it yet. Just had a glass of water and bam, they're gone. If you tell anyone about it, you're dead meat on the hook, boy. That sounds fair. Hey, Pop Singh. Don't serve any water till I've had a chance to check it out. I think something's up with the water supply. No problemo. This California, we not serve water with meals unless customer beg. Poor Sam Andreas. It's a good thing he waters down his whiskey so much or else all his profits would be consumed by glaziers. <laughs> <laughs>